And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jerry to get us started. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I see that we've got about 70 people online and I expect more to be on their way. Uh, this is a little bit of a different webinar for the league. Uh, normally we, we tend to host these things and limit attendance to just our members, but given the topic at hand, I know there's a lot of interest from legislative offices and local police departments from all over the state. So we just decided We'd, we'd have a couple of guests in, ask them to talk a little bit about their research, um, and then have a conversation about it. Uh, we will, to back up and kind of give you the background, the Wisconsin Policy Forum puts out a variety of research reports, and these gentlemen will tell you how many and things like that in a little while, but this one caught my eye in particular when they talked about cuts to police departments as I think everyone in this call has a deep concern about that. And I read through the report and was frankly a little bit shocked to see that what's the statistic, something like one in four Wisconsin police departments have reduced, reduced services and not recently. This was back in 2018, 2019. So it sort of predates some of the, the social angst that we're going through right now. Um, the league has had a longstanding concern about the impact of shared revenue, levy limits, and expenditure restraint, all of which have been kind of flat and unmoving over the years. And we've had little anecdotes here and there of how that was coming home to roost. But this was one of the first statewide pieces of, of clean research that shows the impact of it. So we thought, let's talk about it. Let, let's get a feel for it. So the way this is going to work today is the authors of the research, Jason Stein and Ari Brown from Wisconsin Policy Forum, will step you through the highlights of it. And then I have a couple of mayors that will be jumping into the conversation. Mayor Sean Riley from the city of Waukesha and Mayor Dean Cawford from the city of Nina. And just want them to kind of relate their experience as those of you on the municipal end know, they're right in the middle of budgeting right now. So this is a very timely, very timely topic. But we also wanna create space, as Elizabeth said, for you to ask questions, whether it's of our experts, Ari or Jason, or of our practitioners, Mayor Riley and Mayor Coffert. And uh, heaven forbid, don't ask me any questions unless you, well, yeah, that's just not, not fruitful. But without any further ado, I do wanna introduce Jason Stein, he is the, I always get Jason's title wrong, but essentially the director of research for the Wisconsin Policy Forum. And Jason is joined by Ari Brown, and they're going to talk about trends in local police budgets and spending in Wisconsin. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Afternoon, thank you, Jerry, for, for having us. Uh, and thanks to, to everyone on the call. Uh, as, as Jerry said, uh, we're with the Wisconsin Policy Forum, which is, I, I'm sure you all know, uh, a nonpartisan, independent uh, research organization that does not advocate for or against specific policies, but just you know, tries to provide better information to policymakers for, for better decision making. We are <clears throat> members, our members include you know, not, only, not only the league, but other local governments around Wisconsin, corporations, individuals, nonprofits, uh, school districts, many, many other entities. And so, you know, if you're not a member uh, and you, you find the research valuable, that, that's something to consider. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, trends in local uh, police spending in Wisconsin. And we're going to start out by talking, you know, sort of big picture about, uh, the structure of, of law enforcement in Wisconsin. And then we'll, we'll get into some of the specific issues that Jerry just raised. Obviously, uh, we preface this by saying that um, law enforcement, you know, public safety is an incredibly important local function. It's, you know, if you've ever lived in a time or place without effective and fair uh, law enforcement, you realize pretty intuitively how important it is. And so in Wisconsin, Oh, and by the way, before I before I get into that, I should say just a little bit about some of the, the research that we've done. So 
Uh, one of the big reports we did recently was dollar for dollar, uh, which looked at local government spending in a whole range of areas, including police. And that uh, was, was sponsored in part by none other than the, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. Uh, we have done um, a report under a contract for the city of Milwaukee that looked at police department policies and protocols there in, in the context of, of the national conversation over uh, rethinking policing. And then we've done uh, a couple of research briefs over the last uh, year, 15 months on uh, police spending and funding in Wisconsin. And then we do uh, events not unlike this one, and we've done a couple events over the past year looking at uh, uh, police spending as well as, as the idea of uh, reimagining or, or rethinking public safety in, uh, in particular emergency crisis response in the city of Milwaukee. So uh, to start out, you know, when you look at police spending in the state of Wisconsin, um, the first thing to know is that it, it's pretty typical. Uh, we rank 23rd overall in per capita um, spending on law enforcement in Wisconsin. Uh, this is again in the, in the dollar for dollar report that I mentioned and uses US census data, but we're sort of unique in how we get to this average spending in that we are dead last in the country for state spending on law enforcement. And uh, we rank in the top 10 for municipal spending. On, on law enforcement. In other words, uh, law enforcement spending by the members of the league. And, and why does that matter? Well, you, you'll sometimes hear um, people talk about, you know, in the broader debate about how much, you know, a given city, whether it's Madison or Milwaukee or a smaller community spend on uh, police uh, compared to say, you know, some other municipality, Memphis, Tennessee, or take your pick, but there's not necessarily always a good understanding about the fact that in Wisconsin, um, law enforcement is just a highly local service and that you know, uh, lo local law enforcement entities may be taking on certain duties that other uh, state or county entities uh, might be taking on in other states. So that's, that's an important thing to just think about and to ground us in this, this overall discussion. Here we're seeing uh, law enforcement spending as a share of overall operating and capital spending by municipal and county governments in Wisconsin over the past generation. And, and obviously the thing that, that jumps out at you is that it, it has increased as a share of the total. Obviously law enforcement, very important uh, function, but there are many other things that, that municipal and county governments do. Uh, for municipalities in particular, um, the share law enforcement spending as a share of overall spending uh, peaked in about 2013 and has uh, subsided somewhat since then, but, but remains elevated compared to, to where it was 20 and 30 years ago. Um, despite that, um, given how labor intensive and as a result, you know, uh, subject to inflation um, law enforcement is, you're, you're still, despite that, that rise in spending, not necessarily seeing you know, a proportionate rise in, in actual staffing. So you, looking at, um, in a research brief uh, recently, we, we, this has been a couple of years ago, we, we looked at uh, police staffing in some of the major cities in the state. As you can see uh, on a just absolute basis, uh, some cities at, over that decade period had seen a decrease in sworn staff, and that if you thought if you looked at it more in terms of um, officers per capita, then you know the majority of the of the large uh, larger cities in the state were were down or flat in terms of staffing. Level. One thing to just uh, remind everybody that that a service that the policy forum provides is, and that Ari himself is, is pretty much wholly responsible for, is the uh, municipal data tool, which gets updated every year. And that allows you to, for a given city like Madison here, to look at uh, police spending per capita and to, to compare it to 
you know, in a given municipality to others in the county or to a custom uh, comparison group that the, the local government or citizen chooses. So just, just be aware that if you wanna explore some of these, these trends on your own, you can, you can do that. This uses Department of Revenue data. And it's really important to say that, you know, this data is no better than what is the reported to the department. And that, you know, it may not always match up um, with what is going on in a given community. There can be differences in how different communities report the data. So, you know, understand always that when we're talking about this data, that this is a, this is not the final word on, on anything. It's simply the best statewide data that we have to work with. Um, now we will just, uh, we'll go through uh, this, this Senate Bill 119. So th this legislation, which was uh, approved through the legislature and vetoed by the governor, would have provided a, a reduction in county and municipal aid, a major component of shared revenue for any municipality that decreases the amount of its municipal budget dedicated to hiring, training, and retaining law enforcement officers. Uh, and that that would then become the new uh, baseline, baseline for those aid payments going forward. Um, the, the legislation applied this criteria to fire departments and EMTs as well, and uh, also tied reduction in staff to a, a reduction in county and municipal aid that would be proportionate to the, 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 the this compensation costs for those staff. Um, the exceptions for, there were some exceptions um, within the uh, department, or sorry, there were some uh, exceptions within the legislation and most notably for departments with less than, than 30 sworn staff. In um, doing the research that we did and that Ari's going to uh, talk to you about in just a second, you should understand that the legislation would have provided a, a mechanism for reporting all of this data to the state and it would have that data would have been what is would have been used to um, make the the cuts to to shared revenue. We don't we don't have that data. It's hypothetical. So we had to go to the State Department of Revenue and use uh, data that is there from the annual financial statements that get filed by the municipalities themselves. So you got to understand that that this is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, what we're showing you here. And this is also not necessarily a good correspondence to what is in um, municipal budget documents, but it, it represents the best statewide data that we have about law enforcement spending and um, sworn strength levels within departments around the state. And with that, I will hand it off to Art. Thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Ari Brown and I'm a researcher with the forum. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about our, our most recent research, um, our focus that came out a couple of weeks ago. It's called Some Cuts to Police Predate Calls for Defunding. Um, so what we wanted to, to do with this piece was essentially take the uh, Senate Bill 119 uh, legislation and with the, as Jason mentioned, best data that we have available, kind of look at um, you know, even prior to to both the pandemic and and kind of a lot of the conversations that have been going on around reforming police over the last uh, year or so, we wanted to look at what was going on with police spending in uh, what was, uh, you know, especially compared to now, but also historically a pretty good economy uh, in, in 2018 and 2019. Um, so we use data from the uh, State Department of Revenue. Um, we looked at a specific line item in the municipal finance reports, um, uh, the law enforcement line item, and we basically just wanted to look at, um, you know, what was going on year to year um, from 2018 to 2019 with police spending. Uh, and what you can see in this visual is that we found about 250 different communities throughout the state. Um, this includes towns as well, the cities, villages, and towns, though it is majority cities and villages. Um, that actually decreased um, that one spending on that one line item from 2018 to 2019. And of course, as Jason mentioned, um, that one line item might not line up perfectly with what is in municipal budgets. Um, in a lot of cases, it doesn't, but it is what it is the best data that we have available. Um, 
another important facet of this, I think, is that we found um, that this was not only happening in, in bigger cities like uh, like Milwaukee, like Green Bay, we also found that it was happening in a number of uh, prominent suburbs. And also, as you can see from this map, really in every community throughout the state, uh, in rural areas as well, it was not specific to, um, you know, one, one kind of geography. So we also wanted to look at because, um, as Jason mentioned, part of this legislation was uh, focused on staffing levels, we wanted to look at um, what was going on with sworn strength levels in police departments. Um, also prior to both the pandemic and uh, the protests of last summer. Um, so this pulls in data from the, uh, the FBI's Uniform Crime Data uh, Reporting Tool. Um, this is, we believe, the best source of information uh, that, that accounts for um, staffing levels, not just at the level of the individual department, but both at the level of the state and the entire country. Um, and what we found uh, with this data um, was that there were a number of departments that were uh, increasing their sworn staffing levels. You can see Madison all the way up at the top there. Um, but there were also a number that were decreasing their sworn staffing levels. All in all, this amounted to a net gain of about 90 sworn officers. And this only covers about 300 um, police departments around the state. Um, the FBI data is not comprehensive. Um, it's based on uh, you know, a voluntary reporting system, though most uh, police departments around the country do report to uh, the FBI. Um, but we, we found a a very similar finding here, which was that, you know, even in a, a very good economy and with an overall net gain, um, there were still a number of departments that were decreasing their, their sworn staffing levels for uh, for whatever reason. And I should mention, too, that with spending, while we did find that there were uh, around 250 communities around the state um, that were that were decreasing their um, spending on law enforcement from 2018 to 2019, the overall trend was still positive. There was still growth um, from year to year at the level of the entire state. So. Jason's going to get a little bit deeper into why some of these trends might be going on. Um, but just another figure that we included in this report that we felt like it was important to talk about was kind of the uh, the prior priority that is placed on both uh, police and fire EMS um, in Wisconsin municipalities specifically. Um, so we wanted to look statewide at the, the city, village, and town level, um, what percentage of operating budgets were being spent on, on uh, police and fire and EMS. Um, this data is also from the DOR's municipal finance reports. And what we found statewide was that uh, about 40% of all operating spending goes to just those three items, police, fire, and EMS. Um, as you can see, about 24% to uh, police and about 16% uh, to uh, fire and EMS. Um, but what we also found is that in bigger cities where you are likely to have um, police departments that are bigger, more involved, um, and, and pretty comprehensive as it goes in, in Wisconsin's biggest communities, that percentage is even higher. So in all 10 of Wisconsin's largest communities, um, they beat the statewide average in terms of the makeup of their operating budget um, that goes to police, fire, and EMS. Um, this is using 2019 data, which is the, the most recent data that we have available right now. Um, you can see that that number is uh, even above 50% in places like uh, Kenosha, Racine, and Milwaukee. You can see that Milwaukee spends about three out of every $8 uh, on police alone uh, in, in terms of priority. So when it comes to um, priorities and, and, and reasons that uh, that a, a municipality might decrease its police budget, um, we think it's important to mention how large of a portion these three line items alone uh, account for in municipal budgets. Um, and when tough budget decisions might need to be made, um, this might be one place to look at just in terms of there being you know, financial stressors and, um, and this being a natural place to look. So I'll turn it back over to Jason now to talk a little bit uh, about some of the reasons why we might have seen some of the trends in our research. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a great uh, segue to sort of looking at, at, you know, why is this happening? I mean, you know, again, there can always be, you know, interesting stuff happen within the data. I mean, I know when I looked at that FBI data, um, you know, what was reported in, for Madison in, in 2019, the increase was not was larger than what what was uh, put into the budget documents for the city that year, you know, and that that difference might be due to reporting conventions and, and all kinds of other things. But, you know, again, to sort of talk about, well, to the degree that in some of those cases that we looked at, we were seeing actual decreases in, in law enforcement spending that really translated into, 
you know, effects on services in some of those communities, you know, what could be producing that? I mean, we know that local governments um, around the state face pretty tight levy limits that were put in place by the state of Wisconsin, and that those tie um, increases in operating uh, property taxes by and large to the new construction rates uh, around, you know, in the community and around the state, and that those simply have not been uh, as large in recent years as they were, you know, in 2005, six, when we had uh, levy limits begin. In general, uh, we're also seeing um, state aid just simply not not increase uh, in the way that, that local government costs are increasing. And then as, as Ari talked about, police and fire services are not a modest part of, of local budgets. So when you think about the overall budgeting that a, that a local government has got to do, it's going to be very difficult to hold public safety harmless um, without having you know, a disproportionate impact on other parts of the budget. And, and obviously, whether you're thinking about uh, parks or you're thinking about streets or you're thinking about um, you know, public health for the municipalities that make contributions in that realm, you know, these, are, these are things that are also very important and, and during the pandemic in particular have been very important. So, you know, when we look at and I think finally, it's always important to not look at any of these things in a vacuum or on just a one year or one quarter basis. And police budgets have obviously seen um, a pretty uh, rapid expansion you know, in the 90s and, and during the 2000s. And to some degree that may have put pressure on local government officials to try and balance those public safety costs against some of the other priorities that I, that I just mentioned. And so at this point, um, I will go ahead and stop sharing and we'll, we'll open it up for questions. And because I was sharing, I personally didn't get it, didn't wanna look at the chat or the Q and A. So I, I will do that now and, and see some of the questions that I was missing. Okay, and I will, um, uh, to help you along, Jason, so you don't have to put your readers on like I did, I will ask the first question from uh, Joel Gregazeski um, about other research on this. I'm also going to post something that's more of a comment than a question that Boz Bossert made. Um, but Joel's question is, and it's kind of a two-parter, are there any comparisons available between police spending per capita and crime rates? In other words, is there a correlation? And then kind of tied with that is, are there comparisons available for the number of officers per 10,000 residents and crime rates? Does that research exist? Sure, so th th there is a correlation and you do tend to see um, higher law enforcement spending, at least when you're looking at the level of larger cities, you do tend to see a correlation between um, the, the crime rates in, in an urban area, like say Milwaukee, has both high crime rates and high spending. You see that with Racine. Now, it's not the only thing that that drives um, law enforcement spending. I mean, clearly, um, community preference can be a role in that some of the highest per capita um, spending we may see uh, is in small can be in smaller, wealthier suburbs that may you know choose to have their own police department when you know they might uh, not otherwise do so if they didn't have those means. But, but clearly there is some correlation um, between crime and, and spending. And, and that's something that we have, we have looked at in the past. I mean, certainly at the level of, um, you know, when we, one, one of the briefs that we just talked about looked at that, at that issue. And we've also seen it, so like in our budget briefs on the city of Milwaukee, we've, we've, look, we've done, you know, national comparisons, that sort of thing. Anything to add, Ari? Um, yeah, I, I'll just say that, um... The the uh, if anyone's looking to to look at any of this data at the individual level, um, the FBI's uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Tool is is very powerful uh, and includes a lot of great data. It's one of the better data sources that we're aware of um, on this issue. I know they have um, officer employment level stuff in there. They have crime level stuff in there, and it, it's actually delineated by 
um, type of crime. So you can look at that as well. Um, I'll also note that uh, kind of along the lines of what Jason mentioned, I think a lot of this is pretty community specific. Um, you know, Jason, you mentioned Milwaukee and Racine is, is kind of two places that probably have rather high crime rates, but also um, rather high spending levels just relative to other communities throughout the state. Um, and, but you also mentioned that there was uh, high per capita spending uh, in a number of suburbs. I'll, I'll note that just in doing this research, we found that there were a number of suburbs um, primarily I think in the Milwaukee area um, that had quite high spending levels, uh, per capita spending levels when it came to, to police. Um, the reason for that being, you know, these are these are smaller municipalities in terms of population that have their own police department. Um, and those are places that you're likely to see a, a lower crime rate, but higher per capita spending. So it all really just depends on the kind of community that you're looking at. Um, before we bring in our two mayors to react to this information, I put Boz Bossert's comment up there, and, and I think it's a good illustration that the 1819 data, which is what your report was based on, showed that Port Edwards reduced its, its officer force at that time. But then they came back in later years, and they're now spending more on their police budgets. They're, you know, they're beefing up. So I guess, do you, is there a lot of that kind of volatility in here? I guess to a certain extent there has to be. Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the points that we were just making is that, you know, it can be difficult to sort of base a decision like shared revenue on just what gets reported about some line item in a budget or, and I'll, I'll give you an illustration. I mean, you know, the, the and um, I know Mary Batari is on the call, so she can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it's my recollection that the city of Madison's police department has at various times included or not included um, crossing guards and parking enforcement. Um, you know, and, and, and certainly that's something that could hypothetically be the case. And so again, you could have a community that could move um, its crossing guards into the police department or outside of the police department and show, you know, sort of art of, you know, show an increase or decrease in their police budget. Now, you know, have the mean streets of that community gotten any meaner because of that? No, I mean, you know, there, there hasn't been really any tangible impact in that scenario in what's happened to the actual law enforcement activities, but it, but it does look it lo does look differently. Another example would be: What if you hire civilian employees who are cheaper for whatever reason to do your open records or do your, you know, your your public information work? Um, you may save money there. You may show on paper a decrease in sworn strength, but have you really reduced the number of personnel that are available to to do the sorts of I think law enforcement activities that the public would sort of be most concerned about. That's not necessarily the case. So though, I mean, those are a couple hypothetical examples. Okay. Uh, once again, I wanna remind everybody, if you have a question, uh, use the question and answer button. Um, we're, this is a webinar format, so it's easier, it's easier for us to work from the Q and A. Um, don't put it in the chat, just pop it into the question and answer button. Um, okay, so Mason Becker is posing a question that really is, is more a question of, is the state legislature considering anything to give communities additional flexibility to increase their emergency service budgets beyond referendum, which by the way, Fort Atkinson is looking at moving toward a public safety refer referendum. Uh, their net new construction rate is usually very low. Um, well, I can answer the legislative- I would defer part. to you, Jerry. Uh, Mason, the, the answer on the legislative side is I know a lot of legislators are very interested in this topic. There is no legislation under active consideration at this time that would give local governments any options besides what you're doing, which is going to a property tax referendum. The league, just full disclosure, the league has advocated both increases in shared revenue, which has been stagnant for 30 years, some levy limit relief, but also potentially, you know, let's let's have a, a flavor other than vanilla when it comes to referenda. Instead of just property taxes, perhaps a local or a regional sales tax. But before we let Jason and Ari go, 
I want you to comment on Mason's comment about net new construction. In Fort Atkinson, which is a prosperous Wisconsin city, their net new construction rate is usually extremely low. And I'm gonna editorialize usually well under inflation year after year. Is that the exception or the norm in Wisconsin? Can you just repeat that last point? Because I, I apologize, I was looking at one of the, one of the Q and A's. And my question is, is net new construction running below inf inflation? Is that rare or is that the norm in Wisconsin? I mean, it's it's been the it's been the norm, you know, for for the past decade at least. I mean, you know, we the the kind of net new construction rates that we had on a statewide basis were just much higher at the time when when levy limits were brought into effect in two thousand five two thousand six when we had you know as 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 those of us who are a little bit older remember a very hot real estate market um, in those years. And we just have not have not seen that that sort of net new construction on a, on a statewide basis um, since then. Even you know pre pandemic when we had um, you know a, a, a strong economy. We the other issue that you're seeing is that um, it, it's spotty in terms of what areas get net new construction. So you know if you're in Dane County, um, you know if you're in Hudson you're seeing pretty strong new construction. If, if you are in uh, the rural counties up north, you know, or if you're in the sand county regions of the central part of the state, you're, you're not necessarily seeing the, the kind of growth. And so, you know, that's another sort of wrinkle to, to the issue. I'll also add here just very quickly. Um, in July, we released a report um, that kind of talked about um, property taxes increasing, um, recently and some of the reasons for that um, not necessarily being things like levy limit increases but uh, you know municipal uh, not municipal uh, school district referenda driving those quite a bit um, but we have a, a number in here um, we looked at you know net new construction over the last couple of decades as Jason mentioned and we found that um, the average rate of net new construction across the state has not exceeded 1.7 percent since 2008 um, obviously this being right before the the housing crisis. Um, and it went as low as 0.7% in 2011 and 2012. So prior to um, the, the, the housing crisis, you had you know, net new construction rates that routinely were right around inflation or, or even above it in certain cases. Since then, we haven't been above 2% in any year. Um, and when you're talking about you know, inflation levels being above where that is, um, this is something that, that we've written about quite a bit um, in terms of you know, municipalities in certain cases struggling to keep up with with budgetary needs because the the prices of uh you know salary and, and wages and benefits and things like that are, are increasing uh close to or above the rate of inflation and the municipality is not seeing the same thing on the revenue side okay i mean obviously police and firefighters are also not subject tax 10 which is something that we we haven't mentioned but you know is is a difference between those employees and and the general employees that, uh, that cities and villages around the state would also include. Well, in fairness, they're not subject to Act 10 in that they have more collective bargaining sway, but they still had to pay a portion of their health insurance That's true. And, and their retirement. I just want to be real. A absolutely. I, yep. I want and to avoid at least two or three hate emails that I'm going yeah. to get, Jason. Okay. That that's that's true, and and they also uh, there was also that same year in 2011 a change to health insurance bargaining that 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 you know provided a little bit of leverage for for employers over over what had been the law previous. Right, right. Well, let's go from the 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 theoretical to the as applied in the sense that let's put a couple of practitioners on the screen. We reached out to our mayors and uh, Mayor Dean Crawford from Nina is with us today. If you're not familiar with Nina, it's a prosperous uh, Fox Valley city. And Mayor Sean Riley from the city of Waukesha in Waukesha County is also with us. So as they come up, there's Mayor Riley. And I don't, Elizabeth, I presume you're bringing Dean up when he's available. Yes, one moment. Okay. Ah, there he is. So while Mayor Crawford gets situated, Mayor Riley, what's what's your reaction? Were you surprised to see these data? 
Uh, your police department has grown. You've grown the number of officers recently, correct? Yes. Um, I guess I was surprised it, it, in that about one third of the communities had decreased the number of officers. Um, I understand, you know, I mean, Milwaukee was in a really difficult position and is probably going to have to keep decreasing officers in order to stay afloat. Um, I, I was also kind of surprised to see that the data showed that we had uh, went down uh, for a number of officers for 10,000 people. Um, but I, I, yesterday I dug into the data and what's interesting for us, and this is actually pretty instructive for legislation that tries to take a point in time and says, okay, from here on out, you, you, we're gonna penalize you or we're, we're going to reward you based upon what happens after this point in time. So in 2018, we hired um, another three officers, school resource officers, but with an agreement with the school district for having them pay for portion of that. So we had an, a, an addition of officers and I can tell you that our budget probably didn't have in the police department, it just had the new police officers. It didn't have the money coming in from the school district. So if our agreement with the school district ever ended, we'd probably want to get rid of the three new officers. I hope our police department isn't listening. Um, uh, you know, because it, it would be basically unfunded. Um, it was funded by the school district. And at, it, if that would have happened at that point in time and then something ha happens later than that, you're in a really, really difficult position unless you use creative budgeting, which has kind of already been mentioned. You know, it basically encourages you using different line items in your budget um, to try to make everything work. So um, I, I really, I, I guess my point is, is I'm afraid of the freezing time type of legislation. It really, it creates problems for municipalities. It may put municipalities in a really difficult position based upon what they did immediately before that point in time. Um, it may re really reward them also um, compared to all other municipalities. And it also encourages probably not using your budget line items as what would everyone else would be considered as the be the best way. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's let's bring Mr. Mayor Cawford into this conversation. And for those of you that don't know the mayor's background, uh, I think he's kind of a unique character to be part of this conversation because he oh. He just gave me the, gave me the cut sign. No, <laughs> I thought you didn't want anybody to know. Uh, Mayor oh, no. Crawford is a former member of the state legislature and in fact, is the former co-chairman of the legislature's joint finance committee. So he is one of those, legis he's a former legislator who's had to write state budgets. And I believe in both good years and bad. And Dean and I talked yesterday and I happened to catch him right after he came out of his police and fire budget meeting. So um, this was on his mind, shall we say. But Dean, how do, you re how do you react to this data? Was it a surprise to you? Is it consistent with Nina's experience? What are you finding? Yeah, it was interesting information. And, you know, Jason, uh, uh, you know, he used to write really good stories about me years ago. So uh, it's good to see you, Jason. But uh, it was, um, it, it's not surprising. And when, when when uh, Jerry and I talked yesterday, there's so many facets to this, but none of them are pretty. And we're, we're headed to a, a point where, you know, something's got to give here because we can't continue to operate like we are. I was there in 2011. I was there for Act 10. I, you know, Act 10 worked. But I tell my former colleagues when I see them, uh, it's been going on now for 10 years and it's time to, you know, massage it. It's time to change it. It's time to look at the formula. It's time to look at the levy limits, so those types of things. If nothing else, for public safety, because police, fire, you know, you got all the political stuff that's happened in the last year and a half around the country with regards to police. But I know one thing, we're not, we're not going backwards here in Nina when it comes to protecting our citizens. Our citizens want services. Mike Ellis would always tell me shared revenue is supposed to help pay for the core services, the core services like 
you know, garbage pickup, police, fire, those types of things. And if we can't even do that, in, in a year where the state of Wisconsin took in $4.2 billion with a B of additional revenue and didn't have the, the nuts to, to give us, you know, one additional dollar for municipal and county aid, it, it's a sad day. And so the pressure has got to be coming from the mayors and the people in around the state and, and show them. They, I don't think they fully grasp the problem. We had 35 off, uh, I'm sorry, 40, 45 officers 30 years ago. We now have 41. This is in a day where there's more guns. Nina never used to have a, a murder. We never had a shooting. We never had that. We're having guns uh, problems. We're having fraud. Think how long a fraud, a computer fraud complaint takes for an officer. It's happening a dozen times a day in the city of Nina uh, with banks and financial institutions, domestic violence, mental health. Everyone talks about all the mental health things going up, but no additional dollars coming from the state. So I think we need to hold the legislators to the fire and, 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 and get them to commit and get them to challenge leadership because at the end of the day, leadership's gonna make the decision. So they're individual legislators that, they, that represent them all across the state. You need to get them and, and put their feet to the fire, bring them to the council meeting, show them the police budget, show them the fire department budget and say, you know what? When expenditure restraint program allows us to go up $462,000 this past year. And of that, the fire, the police department took 221 and the fire took 109 of that. That leaves uh, less than $100,000. And, and so there's so many factors, the growth factor, Nina's growing, but yet our growth factor was last year was less than 1%. So uh, it, it's, it's really time for the mayors and municipalities to stand up uh, to the legislature and, and, and ask, tell them that they gotta do something. These are the numbers getting from Jason and Ari that are gonna help us you know, sell that story. Well, and, and it's interesting, Sue Conley posted a question about the state shared revenue formula. And her observation is that it needs to be reworked and updated and asked if anyone was working to create a new formula that meets uh, current needs of municipalities. For those of you who don't know, and by the way, I wanna introduce another person who joined us on screen, the league's government affairs director, Tony Herkert is on screen. Tony worked in the Capitol building for a number of years for another longstanding finance committee member, uh, State Senator Rob Coles from the Green Bay area. So Tony, thank you for being part of this conversation. So getting back to Sue's question about the shared revenue formula. Oh, Dean, how long ago was it that they actually froze that formula? Getting back to Sean's- the last, the last increase to shared revenue, I believe was 2003. It was 2003. And, and, I, and I will say this, I've been in, the, I've been in those meetings and unless you add additional dollars, you're not gonna change the formula because under the formula, there's winners, there's losers. And you know the winners are gonna be happy. The losers are gonna kick and scream. And so it's gonna, you, know, you gotta add more dollars. And, and this was the perfect year to do that. Or you have to relax levy limits. Those are your two choices in my mind, but it was a long time ago. So um, while everything else has got tons of, in, you know, good increases and the state has done a pretty good job of managing things overall. Police and fire and core services of uh, municipalities have suffered. And just think about how difficult it's gonna be when, when um, you know, uh, road projects and that are, everyone's talking about that 30% increases there. So with uh, what's going on right now, so it's gonna get more difficult as we go along. Yep. And the other, the challenge when they when they froze shared revenue many many years ago, um, they froze the formula. So if you happen to catch the wave at a high point, your municipality was getting proportionately a, a better piece of the pie than someone who caught the formula at a low point. The formula used to adjust. Jason, help me here. It used to adjust for poverty and for property value. It doesn't do that anymore. It's just simply whatever you got last year is what you're eligible for this year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If you think about a community like Janesville that, you know, when the formula was frozen or payments were frozen, you know, had a, a prosperous General Motors plant, 
Um, you know, you can just think about all the things that have happened in, in your community or any community around the state since that formula was frozen. And, you know, our, our, not all of our cities are the same cities that they were 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's sort of an obvious thing to say, but I mean, there's implications to it. And, and to answer your question directly, Sue, um, we have been in conversations with a variety of legislators uh, exploring ways you could do that. Um, I don't think we're at a critical mass yet by any means uh, of lawmakers who are willing to take that plunge. Uh, Mayor Crawford is right. It's a little bit of perilous territory because when you play around with funding formulas, some will get more, some will get less, and, and it, nobody wants to be the one that gets less. So it's a bit of a challenge. But quite frankly, it's overdue for adjustment. It needs to be done. Tony, you've watched this from the inside for quite a while. What are your observations? Well, first, I just wanted to say um, there's a comment in the Q&A from Al Rundy from Fiscal Bureau saying that we no longer have a formula. It was frozen in 2001. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there because he um, is an expert and we're lucky that he's on the call so he can um, kind of chime in when need be. Um, I, I think that we're at a great time. We're at a really good time to have this conversation and potentially set up um, a situation for next budget um, where there can be a greater understanding from you know, property owners, property taxpayers, um, and legislators about how this impacts cities and villages. Um, and like Mayor Crawford said, even if it's just a, a public safety issue, if we, take, if we take that component and we look at maybe funding that in a new way or providing some flexibility to local governments, I think it's something we need to set the stage for. Um, the league is well aware of the maintenance of effort requirement that was a conversation in this budget. Um, we recognize the fact that that should no longer be a conversation in um, our next budget. So we're, we're trying to work on getting some information out about how um, our current situation has impacted municipalities for over the past 10 years and what we can maybe do to make that better um, in the future. Let me, um, if I can borrow from Boz Bossert um, and, and be that guy for just a minute here. And I know there are some chiefs of police on the line, but I guess I'm going to pitch this question at Mayors Crawford and Riley, and you know maybe a police chief or two is going to comment in the chat. My brother-in-law is probably going to throw rocks through my window. But when budgets are tight, you you look for efficiencies. You find efficiencies. How would you respond if I were to say, you know, but mayors? perhaps there's some fat that needs to be squeezed out of the system. Is that the case? Is that fat already gone? What do you think? Are there efficiencies to be gained? What's your response to that? Go I'll ahead, start. Sean. You know, I, I'm going to say that there, finding the efficiencies is not as easy as anyone outside of the budget cycle thinks it is, but you can, you can with a lot of hard work and working with your department heads, figure out ways to get efficiencies. Um, following up on that though, um, so I have 157 people working in the police department, 105 working in the fire department for a total of 262 with about 500 employees. If we're in a situation where the police and fire are, are off the table, we're the, and we need to cut. We're, we're in a really difficult position because you're cutting whatever you need to cut. Let's say it's even, you know, 2%, you're cutting 4% from everyone else pretty much because your, 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 your budget is employee driven to a certain extent. Um, in Waukesha, the support for our police and fire by both citizens and the alders is phenomenal. Good example um, is it took a 12 years to get our new, uh, approval for our new city hall to be completed it took one year for the fire for the police department to uh, get approval for having the entire police department all remodeled um, we also built three fire stations in the last 10 years under budget constraints so we're gonna there will be there's always going to be an in, uh, inclination to try to cut 
other than police and fire. Um, but you can find efficiencies in police and fire too. Um, and if you need to cut the budget for that, if you can find ways to cut the budget for that, obviously that's a hard decision to make, and, but it would, be, it would be made. Dean, how would you respond to that question? I would just add, uh, I, I would add this, um, that uh, you know, we used to have more than we do now and we, we don't. So we've, we've picked all the low hanging fruit. Um, police and fire, when people dial 911, um, they, they need help, they, they need uh, assistance. And so longer response times in that are not gonna go well. Um, and I would just say this, that uh, uh, they 87% uh, of your costs probably in police and fire are personnel costs. And the calls for service, I've just shot, I think in every community have shot up dramatically. And I, I can remember a time years ago, the city of Menasha, Tom Siski, he, he uh, in his budget, he put the cut four firefighters and he was ran out of office. And uh, that would, ha that, that'll happen all over, I think in the state. So it, it's, you know, we've, we've taken all the low hanging fruit. We've done all the, the, the smoke and mirrors in these departments. And, you know, I was there for Act 10. Like I, said, I can't emphasize enough, it worked because we'd be in a heck of a lot worse problem. But I do remember telling Governor Walker that um, having two types of classes of uh, employees was gonna come back to haunt us at some point. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, we have to treat them different. And, uh, you know, it, it's probably there. Okay. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, couple of, one question and one comment in the Q&A. Adrian Bump, uh, can you see that now? Is that, Elizabeth, help me out here. Is, is Adrian's comment visible? It is. It's visible to panelists, not to the... Um... Okay, what Adrian is saying is um, many of us, he said, we, he, she said, work, work hard every year to reduce spending, to get things more efficient, and the hope is that you can get better wages for employees than they currently have, uh, reduce spending and waste so we have more for employees. A 1% raise year after year is hard. Uh, then we also want more positions in addition, which is, is hard. So I'm gonna post that. But then Judy Rogers is asking, uh, I think a good question for discussion, makes the statement that policing and EMS is local. Shouldn't we ask our citizens how much more they want to pay for these services? And the follow on question is, why don't more municipalities push for referendums instead of pushing the state for a larger share of revenue? Would um, one of the mayors, would you care to take that one on? Uh, since I've been there, the referendum has always been the answer. Um, consistently, legislators will use it. You can go to referendum. Um, there's a cost to referendums. Uh, it becomes very, it, many times it splits your communities in half. I think the elected officials are there to do their job. And, um, you know, she is correct where she says these are pretty much local decisions. I think Fond du Lac just passed a referendum, if I'm not mistaken, for uh, yes. police services. So there's been successful referendums. Referendums uh, are, are an avenue to go to, but uh, it's really because I think, you know, the legislature refuses to, uh, to, to look at this for a variety of reasons. Um, we have to, you know, we can't wait till the next budget. We have to wait till the next election which is, uh, in, you know, coming up and people are going to have to hold people's uh, candidates feet to the fire and say, will you consider uh, the, the positions of the municipalities and the struggles they're having with play, paying for public safety? Um, I can I can just add one one piece to this, maybe. Um, so I, I referred earlier to a, a piece that we did um, that came out in July that looked about uh, looked at why property tax rates were increasing. And, and one of the things we took a look at in that piece was was referenda, not just school referenda, but also municipal referenda. Um, there was actually a great uh, report, a, a study that was, uh, I believe commissioned by the league, but uh, done by a number of students at the La Follette School of Public Affairs that looked at municipal referenda uh, and found that there were, uh, and we included this in our in our uh, research because we thought it was so interesting that there, there were just 31 uh, municipal and seven county referenda that passed uh, over the course of a 12 year span from 2006 to 2018. Um, 
which is, uh, you know, for anyone that, that has looked at school referenda is not only well below the number of school referenda that happen on a year to year basis, but also the, the passage rate is much lower uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, so that that's, I think, just another interesting piece of this. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out as well is when you're talking about referenda, you're, you're you know, you're referring to a, an increase in the property tax, ultimately, at least under current, you know, state statutes um, versus, uh, you know, when you're advocating for um, higher shared revenue, that that's obviously a cost that is not incurred on, uh, you know, directly, at least on, on the citizens or the, the residents of the municipality, but rather on, on the state. Um, so just kind of money coming from revenue coming from different things. Mayor Riley, and we're, we're going to run short of time, and I want to give the two mayors a chance to express any closing thoughts. But Mayor Riley, did you want to respond to the question about, well, why not go to referendum for police and fire? Um, it's, it is always a, a, something that can be done. I think the pain has got to be pretty well documented um, that it's needed. Uh, I know that we're not there with like the First of all, I need the Common Council to be in favor of it and be uh, uh, willing to go that route. Um, I can say that we haven't talked about it because we are scraping by each. We kind of have a status quo budget each year. Um, the police department doesn't get their additional sergeant. Um, uh, they always ask for one. Um, if the pain gets strong enough, we'd, we'd go out for a referendum. Uh, and I, I agree with Dean, it, it, it causes a lot of controversy in the community. It separates the community. And you kind of, you know, I understand that it's like, well, let's have the community make a decision on it. Um, but I think we've had enough conflict um, over the last couple of years. And I don't want to go that route unless I absolutely have to. Okay. And um, I want to add one other thing that was something that was implicit in Judy's question is this. This somehow this belief that going to the state legislature and asking for an increase in shared revenue is going somewhere asking for money that's not yours. I just want to remind the group that shared revenue was created for the primary purpose of funding local government. Uh, when Wisconsin adopted an income tax in 1911, check the history books if you, if you doubt me, um, they sold that they went to public referendum, statewide referendum, and it was sold on the basis that 90% of the income tax would be sent to local governments for local operations. So there's a, there's a bit of a myth here that shared revenue is somehow the state's money and the property tax is local government's money. That's not the way it was structured almost 100 years ago. Jason, am I wrong with that? I know I'm not, but I'm just putting it. <laughs> I think I think it's I think it's a fair summary that and that there was originally, as I recall, the, the income tax money went back to the communities that it came from, by and large. So it was, you know, to that to that degree at that time. And then the shared revenue formula fine-tuned that to account for poverty and wealth. Okay. We are going to have to wrap it up here to give everybody to finish this up by one o'clock. Um, let's start with Mayor Crawford. Any closing thoughts or comments? Yeah, I'll just say this. Um, all politics are local. And, um, you know, even though the legislature, which I was there and I believe that everything we did was, you know, was good or, you know, that we were responsible for making the state great. At the end of the day, local government, they're the economic engines that are driving this train. It isn't the government, it's the communities. This is where the, the dollars are being generated. You know, companies are deciding to locate for a lot of good reasons that the state legislature has made good decisions on, you know, lowering the tax base and things like that. But also the decisions that, you know, us and local government make, that's why they're expanding their companies here. That's, not, that's why they're not going to other states. So that 4.2 million was a common that, you know, increase in additional unanticipated revenue. Those were dollars that were generated by not just the Wisconsin state legislature and the state government, you know, local governments help generate those dollars. And we're the, we're the, we're the engine that drives the train in many ways all across Wisconsin with these 
uh, you know, income tax, uh, corporate income tax is up, sales income tax is up. There's a lot of reasons for that. But when, when things are up and there's a rising tide, I would hope we could at least share that rising tide to ensure good public safety throughout our state. Mayor Riley, closing comments? Sure, thanks. Um, the policy forum is, you know, their studies have shown that like Wisconsin spending on police um, is right in the middle of all the states. Um, I think there's some communities are doing fine with, uh, you know, paying for their police and fire. I think that what's happening though is um, with levy limits, we're running, we're going to be running into a wall in the future. Um, some communities are already there if they'd have no net new construction or very low net new construction, or they have costs that weren't anticipated 10 years ago. Um, fire departments are a phenomenal example um, where you have a lot of fire departments that were volunteer or paid on call. They need a lot more people um, to be employees, not just um, being paid a, a little bit each month or each year. Um, I think for me, Waukesha is not doing poorly. And I'm not saying, you know, I, 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 we don't need to go to a referendum to pay for our police and fire that we want. I think we're, sooner or later, we may get to that point if there's no changes. But what I've always, what I tell my legislators is we, it would be much nicer to have more than just property tax. I'd like to have the ability to do sales tax. I'd like to have um, maybe a portion of income tax in almost every other state. There's more than one leg to the stool that, that holds up um, the finances for a municipality. In Wisconsin, you have shared revenue, expenditure restraint, and uh, the property tax, and the property tax takes on the lion's share of that. And uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a workable for formula for going into the future, unless we're allowed to increase our levies. Okay. All right. Obviously, a continuing conversation. Mayor Dean Crawford from Nina, Mayor Sean Riley from Waukesha, thank you for being with us. Tony Herkert from the League Office. Oops, wait, no, you'd better not be in the League Office. Thank you for being here. Ari Brown and Jason Stein, Wisconsin Policy Forum. Excellent work as always, gentlemen, and we look forward to the next report. Everyone, thank you for being with us today, and uh, we will see you again. Have a good, have a good weekend.